Hi guys,、uh, this is Nicholas Cole, and I am putting together a process video for you guys、uh, that walks through a little bit of my process, specifically、uh, how I use the different tools and brushes I do in Procreate,、uh, and when those sort of come into the process、uh, as I go. I apologize in advance. I am、uh, sick, so my voice may be a bit、uh, suboptimal for this recording. But this is actually the second time I'm doing the audio for this. The first time I recorded right into the iPad, and uh, the uh, the the Apple Pencil tapping on the screen sounded like thunder every time it struck. So here we go, round two. So first things first,、uh, a brush that I use right off the bat and really throughout the process. Uh, is Tara's oval sketch brush.、Uh, that's a brush that I adapted,、um, or sorry, rather adopted pretty quickly off the bat.、Uh, early in Procreate, I realized a lot of the defaults weren't working for me,、um, but this particular one with its sort of oval print and its slight grit, it has like a tooth to it.、Uh, I find is is just a really useful one. For getting the effects that I wasn't getting out of the default brush sets、uh, when I opened up Procreate to begin with, so I get a lot of great thick to thin.、Uh, just when it's on its point, you get a lot of of good variance and some of that that tooth, and go from light to dark and a little bit thick to thin, and you can see sort of the grain there as I zoom in.、Um, but that's just on its point and on its side. When you tilt the brush or rather the stylus,、uh, you get a nice big thick kind of.、Uh, Soft field with a toothy texture to it, and that was a new thing for me. But I, I I found that I really love using the tilt function. Yeah, I could still use it to get sort of those crisp edges and fill in full pitch black darks, but with tilt and the pressure sensitivity on the side of the Apple Pencil, I can get kind of a a bit of a gradient and nuance as I go painting with with the sketch brush. So for those reasons, I really like it. In general, for the tools that I use, I like to have、uh, something as versatile as I possibly can,、um, something that you know will respond to multiple situations and parts of my process. So it's not just like eighteen brushes to do one drawing. So、uh, I'm just gonna write these down as I go.、Uh, Tara's oval sketch that's made by Tara. I'm gonna butcher your last name, Tara. I'm sorry, Jaguari, Jaguari.、Um, She goes by Dizzy Tara online, and she makes a lot of great brushes.、Uh, definitely worth downloading her brush pack and checking it out.、Uh, for Procreate specifically,、uh, there's a lot of great options that she's done.、Uh, I happen to feel the Oval Sketches is, is her best for me, but definitely there's a lot of other really good ones in her set. I think what what pulled me to her work too is that she's a stylist and kind of a cartoonist in a similar way that I am, and in a way that I understand.、Uh, So、uh, I think we you know, all tend to use tools in a different way and think about painting and and drawing in a different way. So sometimes it helps to find somebody who makes brushes who has a natural painting or drawing style that's closer to your own. So、uh, starting the drawing, you know, I I just go in really loosely, lay in the the sketch work with this brush. I'm using it sort of. In a thick version on its point, a little bit on its side to cover some sort of、uh, broader surfaces. Mostly,、uh, this phase is just about、um, trying to get the shapes down and figure out what those are. Streamline the function I'm playing with here can help to sort of、uh, just bring the the stroke into line a little bit better.、Uh, I wouldn't advise personally adjusting that slider too far up, but it's a great feature if you like a little bit of line correction.、Uh, I find that you know it's not always ideal. Sometimes I want all the little like. Excuse me. All the little nuances of my my hand in the process,、uh, but often I want to just get those clean shapes down, and I, I find a little bit of streamlining smooths the stroke of the brush just enough. So a lot of this, I mean, I'm going to be doing this video in real time, so there'll be a little bit of dead air every now and again. Hopefully, it's not too boring for you guys.、Uh, the reality is, the process, even for just a little thing like this, does take a while, and that's just art in general.、Um, But I've tried to find ways to streamline my process to be as efficient as possible, within the the limitations、uh, that I've set for myself, and that Procreate. Ha- I mean, pro- it would be I'd be remiss to say that Procreate doesn't have certain limitations to it. It definitely, if you're used to certain things that Photoshop does, 
you might find that Procreate doesn't quite have the feature sets that you are used to or are looking for uh, in the exact same way. But I would say after working for two years exclusively on my iPad Pro and in Procreate for all my professional work, uh, that it's definitely a viable tool. And anything that's a sort of clunky or inefficient about it is uh, made up for by other features that it gets really right. One of those, I think, is Tilt. I think I really like the way that, that Tilt works um, with the stylus in this program. So the, the subject matter, I did a bunch of different sketches before this video uh, and ultimately landed on a goblin because it is apparently Goblin Week, which like, I guess like an Inktober or Mermaid is just one of those themed weeks, but kind of a little more of a low-key uh, one. But I, I tried to sort of decide on what the subject matter would be. I think for a tutorial, uh, the easiest thing is something simple, something that's not too too sort of designy. Uh, I, for me, a goblin like this is just a delight because it's all these like nasty little overlapping wrinkly shapes and I don't have to think about making something super symmetrical or pretty or smooth. I can just uh, really show you what I mean about painting with all these like wrinkles and folds and fun wacky shapes. Whereas if I were doing like a a, a beautiful little child, uh, it would be a totally different situation. You're always worried about the symmetry. It's harder to to get that right. And you spend a lot of time just kind of working at the nuances of that. And it's not as easy to see the progress as on something kind of wriggly, um, wrinkly, <laughs> I mean wrinkly and uh, a little bit nasty. And also, I just love, I love bats. I have a screen full of bat reference in front of me as I draw. Usually, I would import that into Procreate and have that on the uh, on the screen, but I didn't want to clutter things too much for this video. So just uh, assume that in the course of a normal process, I probably would have done a little research into some bats and some goblins I like or little creatures that I find inspiring for this sort of thing. Um, it's kind of debating on, you know, design-wise, like, what shapes I like. I'm kind of pulling in, like, a hairless cat's wrinkles for the forehead here. Just to give you some interesting texture for when I color and, and, and show you the lighting later. Working in some of the striations in his, his ears, just thinking about texture. This part of the process is all about planning. I, I, I'm thinking as I go a lot about flow and about the different shapes and how they connect. I'm not trying to get every line just right. I'm trying to think visually through where I want this uh, design to go. So I'm going to show you here. I'm. Uh, this is not like literally, I'm trying to map out uh, all, how I think about the sh shape flow, but certain things... Uh, it's easier to to just show <laughs> than explain, especially when it comes down to shapes and shape language, uh, where I might normally like have certain things protrude or certain things sort of favor the anatomy. In this instance, I'm enjoying allowing the, the lines, shapes, and anatomy to run along these big shapes and the sort of flow of these shapes together. So the big one is like his nasty little dome and then this tiny little underbite kind of pug-like chin that he's got going on and that's counterbalanced by this energy of the wrinkles sort of uh bending the neck the other way um but all of these lines kind of you can see how they kind of flow and converge together um they all flow into each other and, and don't sort of dead end uh at like a perpendicular right angle if that makes sense because that can really sort of pull you up short sometimes that's desirable in a design that you want to suddenly be uh, interrupted the flow um, that's why this nose, I have it sweeping back here to sort of, uh, flow along with the overall dimension of his like eye sockets and cranium as it sort of all flows down into his mouth, which I think is just a fun dynamic shape to play with the big round masses of his eye sockets and all these little, uh, lines trying to connect them in my head with each other and I don't usually diagram this out this is definitely like for the benefit of sort of showing how I'm thinking um but uh under the surface you know once once you have internalized a lot of how the anatomy would work sort of in its most correct form then you can start to find ways that are uh pleasing to you to sort of break it so 
with that in mind, uh, maybe it might be interesting to try breaking the flow with the nose and sort of jut it out at a different angle. Uh, not every version of that's going to be the best looking one. Mm, I'm not sure about this one. It doesn't quite have the flow that I want. It's interrupting everything, and it kind of intersects with the ear in kind of an awkward way now. But I'm not as sold on the first version, so i think about... Yeah, so if I were to, you know, just to interrupt the flow with the ears as well, you could definitely do a version of this design where the ears jut sort of awkwardly off it, and that's fun too. It really depends on what you want to draw the eye to and, and, and what you, you want to do, but right now I'm just enjoying the, like folds of this shape that flows down into his neck that kind of wraps down into his chin and, and all kind of coheses together into this single gesture yeah so once i've got sort of the shapes down uh loosely uh, i'll scale down my brush again i'm sticking with tara's oval sketch here I can have the power to make it big and, and wide on tilt, but now I'm I'm using it on point to get a lot of sort of fine uh, sketch lines, which is again why I think the brush is, is a powerful one, because I can get those really spindly, great textured pencil sketch lines and the big sort of chalky wash without ever having to really change any of the settings or, or fiddle with any of the, even the sliders, which I think is great. Um, so again, just trying to respect that flow Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's <laughs> kind of losing myself in, in the process here. I'm thinking as I do this too about what's going to be in front of what else and which things are going to be which color. Uh, how to sort of, even as I'm sketching, I'm I'm thinking a little bit in the back of my mind about light. And that just comes with time, I think, as you practice and you sketch a lot, you design a lot. Uh, it's kind of like um, like driving a car for the first time. You're always, you're thinking about which foot is on which pedal and what gear it's in and, you know, whether the blinkers are on and off and stuff like that. And after a couple of years of driving that car, it's all second nature to you. And you can think about, you know, how your day went and... You know, you can listen to the radio and not freak out. Uh, but this first couple goes around, uh, you're just uh, white knuckling it. It's the same with sketching and, and planning these things out. At first, you're just thinking about, oh, my gosh, like, is the drawing OK? Are the lines going to be all right? Once you're in a place where you can be a little more zen about it, you, you can trust your muscle memory. Start to think about, OK, well, how am I going to light this and color this and what shape uh of, you know, uh, I think probably I'll, I'll settle on a lighter or pinkish color for the nose or the inside of the ears. What shape will that take? What will that look like? Um, I'm sort of fussing with the nose here. I, I, I like the idea of, of bringing it down and just favoring the overall dome of his head and that sweep back, kind of creating a little, a little more of a stunted pug nose. I don't know. I'm playing with it. I think I like it. It's, uh, you know, when you're doing this, these kind of little creatures, especially think, I'm thinking about goblins, I'm wondering how much bat versus how much goblin do I want in here? I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to do the, like, traditional goblin hook nose, and goblins are such a weird little subspecies of, of like, fantasy creature that they really can be anything. That's what's so fun about them. That's the other thing that's fun about drawing creatures for a tutorial like this, is that there's no clear rules that we all understand about how it should look does that make sense if, if you know if i were drawing a like a you know a pretty girl or a, a gritty muscly man or whatever you know we'd all have ideas about how that should turn out and would look right but i can make all kinds of weird decisions about the anatomy and flow of this goblin and uh no one can tell me i'm wrong <laughs> it also helps to just be able to talk through it and turn my brain off a little bit and not worry about whether it looks sort of uh, quote-unquote correct. So I'm definitely missing some of the bat anatomy there in the nose. So I'm going to go back and add some less obtrusive 
sort of shapes to it. I love that stuff, the kind of star-nosed mole, weird bat-nosed stuff that, uh, just one of those recurring obsessions I've had for a couple years now. I think I feel pretty good about that, yeah. Maybe a little extra kind of background layering of shapes there. I think that might be too much. I'm thinking here about how to bring that nasty little grimace kind of around and into his lower lip and connect those lines. So right now they're not sort of flowing, uh, but there we go. Okay, so now I'm going to tuck that chin into that shape and create a new fold to nest the next one in and then a, a bigger fat fold to nest that one in. So each of those folds kind of is its own volume. Instead of thinking of those as just lines across one shape, I'm trying to think of those as physical tubes of flesh that kind of sit into each other. I'm trying to show you a little bit of that right there. Letting the lines round the form kind of travel up and around, touch the ear, mirror that on the other side. Symmetry with stuff like this is always so tricky and perspective, and that's always a, a an Achilles heel for me as I go. But he's feeling all right. It's really freeing to just uh, let loose and do something a little bit more kind of gross looking. A lot of the, the contract work I have right now is, uh, you know, very fun, and but geared towards making things look uh, cute and beautiful. Uh, and I really enjoy that, but it's always the case, just like with, uh, you know, if you were eating the same food again and again every day, you'd, you'd start to crave something else. So I'm definitely craving some some nasty little monsters. Yeah, all right. I don't want to extend that neck or uh, little teeth, little nasty teeth. Those little teeth help you sort of see how you might cluster detail in certain areas, leave other areas big and wide and blank, like the back of his neck and the shape of his ear, but cluster it in the middle of his face where you're paying attention. Have those little high-frequency details like teeth. Now, since it's a goblin, I, I don't know why, but I always want to put an earring on. And if I had more time, I might spend more time thinking about what specifically a bat goblin earring would look like. But for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to keep it to a, a pretty basic like earring shape. I don't know why, but goblins got to have earrings, you know? Little piratical little dudes always stealing shiny stuff. It gives him an asymmetry too that I think I I think I like. Generally speaking, yeah, you don't really think of goblins as being very symmetrical. They always have like a missing limb or an eye patch or something hanging off the side of them or a big weird set of you know, warts or deformities or something like that. That's kind of what they're they're about. It's kind of a chaos. All right. Yeah. That's feeling good. I think uh I think we're gonna move soon into blocking because I think the line art's in a place where I feel pretty good about it. I feel like those shapes are worked out to a degree that I'm excited about. So what I'm gonna do, uh I'm gonna erase that sketch layer that I started with. I don't think that's super important anymore. Um I'll just check for recording still. Okay, good. Uh, and I'm going to add... Well, here's what we're going to do. In terms of process, what I'll do here, I'll, um, I want to create a, a finish illustration that has the energy of those lines that I've just drawn, but not literally the lines. I've just been, been favoring a lineless style lately, and that's part of what this tutorial is going to show you. I want to think of it like like line. I want to think of it uh, with those those shapes in the way that I, I used to, which is very much in that comic style where I would ink, uh, you know, and, and go from this stage of the sort of loose pencils to like very crisp, clean ink line work. And instead of that, what I'll do is I'll block out the silhouette in color and begin to paint up from there. 
And the blocking part of the process is kind of the most boring. I'll pick a sort of general neutral color, trying to decide on, you know, just where to start. It doesn't have to be the final color I go with for this guy, but it'll just give me some place to, to begin. Oh, and what I'm using here is the, the Max's Shader Pastel Brush. This is a brush I really love. It's got uh, kind of a soft grit to it that I find is just really pleasant. And I use it for a lot of things, but specifically right now I'm going to use it for blocking it. If you take a look at it, even just to use it uh, as a blocking brush, it's just got such a pleasant sort of soft tooth to it. Um, that particular grit texture I just think is so pleasing that it's just fun to use. I just enjoy the way it goes down. Uh, there might be other brushes that would do the job too, but uh, this one I, I find I also use later and it, its texture merges really well with uh, Tara's brush, I find. So I'm going to write that down. Again, Max has a great brush set, uh, especially a recent one that he came out with that has some great options in there for a lot more kind of traditional style, like oil and acrylic painting. Uh, and I would definitely give that a shot uh, and take a look at uh, what he does with, with his new brush sets there. But for, for the purposes of this tutorial, just using the one that I, I found to be the most versatile in my process and, and my main for couple of years now and that's been the shader pastel brush so again yeah Tara's is for sketching and Max's is for sort of large blocks of of color shading and that sort of larger areas of, of toothy grit when we get to it but for now I'm just going to use it in its sort of largest form to block out the big areas of the silhouette Back to what I was saying about inking, I want to keep this shape uh, as tidy as possible. Um, and since I'm not going to be inking my lines, this part of the process is when I begin to make those decisions to keep things really crisp and tight and clean. Um, and sometimes it can be frustrating, it can be pretty boring, you know, but so can inking, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a part of the process where you can turn your brain off a little bit and kind of go, get into a meditative kind of Zen space and just enjoy the the simple polishing of shapes. Usually when I do this uh, in the course of my normal work, this is like podcast city. This is when I'll turn on a show or an audiobook. I love an audiobooks because um, I don't have to think about the design and my brain's not running a mile a minute. I don't think I like this color though. I think I'm gonna shift that. Yeah, so maybe something a little blue or a little darker. Something about like the nighttimey kind of nocturnal vibe is what I want for this guy. So you continue blocking him in. Yeah, and then uh, so from that point, I've got sort of the the big shapes blocked in very loosely there with the shader pastel. What I'm gonna do is because I want the crisp cleanness of the uh of the shapes to to start off with so i'm going to use tara's oval sketch now to finish uh more tidily blocking off those shapes and filling in this silhouette oh excuse me so tara's oval sketch is going to give me a lot more sort of direct sort of small control over what i'm doing uh as opposed to the sort of big loose texture. If if I were going for a more painterly loose kind of look, I might stick with Max's and kind of have that loose texture sort of all around. And I've done that in a lot of pieces actually. Just keep the sort of uh sort of fuzzy, toothy edge uh to the drawing and use that as the the basis for what goes on top of it. Um but in this instance and in, you know, I, with concept art, I think generally you want things to be clear. Uh, they can be gestural, they can be fun, and you can get as painty as you want in your personal work, but I think that uh, ultimately uh, the work that I usually do, I wind up handing a drawing over to somebody who's supposed to model it in 3D, and if it's all these sort of big, vague, watercolory fields of texture and color, uh, most people are not going to know what to do with that. So I find it's really helpful to think about the clarity of those shapes and, and, and give them a, something as tidy and crisp as I can make it in the time that I'm given. The concept art's always a balance between, you know, you don't want to make it so pretty, so shiny, so polished that it takes you forever. And also, you know, it, it's not the finished product. 
I'm I'm used to at this point uh trying to balance between uh the the desire to create beautiful finished artwork and the reality that my job is usually about being part of the process that I I pass it on then to the the modeler and the the people who are going to make the final design a reality on the screen and then animate it and, and all that good stuff Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, I go back and forth here with an eraser to, to keep all my shapes really clean. It seems tedious and frankly it is, I, you know, I would otherwise speed this part of the, the video up, but I think this time I'm going to leave it just so that you get a, a much clearer idea in real time of the kind of work that, uh, goes into this. And again, this is podcast city. So I'm, I'm usually listening to something and kind of letting my brain turn off at this point, or in this case, talking to you guys, uh, you know, it, it's a a less thinking intensive part of the process. But I find if I, if I spend the time setting up the shape really tidily and well, it makes the process that much easier in the future. And so this is kind of my eating my vegetables where I might not want to sit and make everything nice and tidy and crisp, but I'll be glad I did later. Yeah. How was your day? <laughs> I find actually in this part of the process that my my brain is so uh it's so engaged when I'm I'm sketching and and sort of conceiving of the design and it's quite engaged later when I'm doing a lot more of the sort of uh dimensional painting of the design. But it's an in-between phase that my uh, my brain tends to start to eat itself alive. This is the time of my day when these conversations from like three to five to like ten years ago will resurface and I'll be sitting here blocking in the shapes thinking about like, oh man, like, did I say the wrong thing at like summer camp when I was... <laughs> so that's again, it's, it's best for me to put on a, an edifying educational podcast. Um, or just the adventure zone and let that kind of help me not overthink and even overthink the process. I think sometimes at this point it can be helpful to turn your brain off a little bit and just think in shape and kind of react intuitively to what you're seeing. You probably can't even see. I'm try I've turned the brush cursor on for this video, but in some instances I think you can't, you can barely even see it. Uh, you just have to trust me at this point. I'm doing a lot of little touching up of the the smoothness of the the silhouette I'm trying to make sure it's it's just right and that's where i'm thinking about the flow of those lines you know i'm trying to in, in the sketch you know you'll use three or four lines to describe one shape or you know or even just one line will be made up of three or four lines and in this part of the process i am making a decision about which line you know, which shape, which edge is going to be the the final edge for the the finished piece. It helps and it depends on, on again, your, um, your approach. But right here is I'm sort of fussing with the underside of his chin to note that, uh, at least with this particular drawing and design and style, uh, I tend to avoid almost every straight line every line needs to have kind of a bend to it or a dynamic you know it's a, it's wrapping around it's a little bit round there's kind of a an overall bend to every line every shape so that it's never too flat and whenever i'm noticing something is sort of flattened itself out like under this chin i'm trying to give it a little more of a a full feeling so it feels like it's got some dimension to it if that makes uh makes sense and i've forgotten his little teeth so i gotta go back in and give him a little snaggle tooth I, I could definitely adjust these things later on down the line uh you know and add things and take things away but i think that you know again if i set myself up well and get all the little details little snaggle teeth and stuff like that blocked into place right at the outset uh, then I will be a happier me in the future as I'm finishing this drawing. 
so that's pretty much yeah that that right there you have just gone through the most boring part of the process with me uh and the hardest one to include in a tutorial because it's just that's just draw it's just just work just working out the shapes fussing with detail and maybe you know some people love it i'm not always the most detail oriented person so you may be hearing it in my voice and dialogue like i kind of need to talk myself into it sometimes and i think that's okay i think not every part of every process needs to be like a delight because again i know that i'm going to like the result of the groundwork i'm laying so sometimes that discipline to just do the the tidy clean work if this were an issue of a, like a landscape or a, a city scene, this would be the part where I'm setting up the perspective grid and figuring out the vanishing points and stuff. It's laborious, it's boring, but once you get to the part that's fun, you'll be really glad that you set up the part that wasn't fun just right. So now I'm thinking about secondary colors. And even within this, this basic shape, what I've done with a... So see here, I'm doing a two-finger swipe to the right. And that locks the pickle, pick, <laughs> locks the pickles, locks the pixels. If you see the the checkers on that layer, that means that now the pixels of that layer are locked. And if I paint a new color onto this layer, it's going to stay locked within the shape that I just created. I'll show you an example right now. But what I'm going to use to do this is the big soft brush, uh, which is clearly not made for handwriting, <laughs> but I use it for large gradients. Um, and uh, that is generally the, the role that this plays is sort of it replaces the gradient tool that Procreate doesn't have uh, that I used to use a lot in Photoshop. Uh, that big soft gradient, uh, I thought that was going to be a real big problem when I transferred over to Procreate, that it didn't have a gradient tool. But I find that the soft brush actually... Adapting to that gives me a little more control over the gradients that I use in a piece. Like now I can paint them in instead of just like sort of clicking and dragging them in. And uh, I think actually it's been a blessing in disguise. I actually find that I like the result of a more painted set of gradients uh, a little bit more than I, I like the procedural gradient tool. So making that nice and big. What I'm thinking about now is sort of the colors of his skin. I think, you know, with a lot of uh, critters like this... Um, their underbellies are paler and less uh, get less sunlight or even you know whatever moonlight uh, in this instance. And so I'm trying to create kind of within this blue green space that I like for him using a couple colors, I'm trying to lightly brush in some some more saturated tones to that just to see what it does. Uh, and create a transition from his underbelly to the sort of backside of him. And since it's all just to do with his like skin tones, it's not important that it be on a new layer. I can keep it all within that basic silhouette layer because uh, this is all just sort of the underpainting. So trying out a little like of a, of a slightly greener tone here, creeping up the bottom of them. See if I can go even lime greenier with it. Uh, sorry about my cold. I feel like I sound real stuffy. Pardon me. Yeah, just sort of stepping back and looking and, I, you know, people ask a lot about color and how I make color decisions, but a lot of it is just checking it against things. I start with that blue color, that kind of gray blue, and I know I like that. And so starting somewhere and then bouncing colors off that, testing them, brushing back and forth, you know, trying it, it's still a process of guess and check for me. Uh, it's still, you know, there's things I know now that I like quite a bit. But it's always a process of kind of going back and forth and seeing what I like. So now that that's sort of in a place that I feel good about, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that layer, you see that, and then create a new layer. On that new layer, I'm going to use that selection to create a mask just by clicking mask. So now that layer uh, is, is masked just like the way I, I had those pixels locked except now I can paint within the, the, the shape of the original silhouette. So I'm using that silhouette that I took all the time sort of making sure it was really nice as a mask for all the other shapes that I'm going to paint in the different colors. So what I mean by that is his nose and his teeth and the inside of his ear are all going to be different colors. 
I'd like those to stay within the lines. And so using a mask to do that, I can keep all of that kind of contained. So I can paint a little more freely. Uh, on the inside edge, I'm going to still have to keep it real tidy. Uh, and think about that, where you can see me brushing right now. Uh, keep that, that tidy, go back and forth. But also keeping it on separate layers allows me to use the eraser and to sort of, you know, take chunks back out of the, the colors I'm using. That allows me to play with opacity. It just gives me a lot more freedom with the new colors I'm adding rather than painting all those local colors onto a single layer. I've done a color video before, but just to refresh your memory, uh, if you've seen that one, local color just means the sort of absolute color that an object is. So we say sort of objectively, he, his skin is kind of a dark greenish gray blue. And objectively, the inside of his ears are pinker, and that's all I'm doing right now. And I'm, I'm not sold on this pink entirely, but it's a starting place, and right now all I'm concerned with is blocking in the shape of the pink. For this, again, so you know, I'm using Tara's Oval Sketch Brush. It gives me a little bit of tooth. It gives me the opportunity to add some gradient when I want to, uh, to sort of fade things in and out as I'm painting in the other regions of color. But it also allows me that tight specificity that I like about it to sort of make sure things are crisp where I want them to be crisp. <laughs> So I'm going to lower the opacity on that and see, let that blend with the underpainting a little bit. Uh, whoops. <laughs> I accidentally undid the mask there. Uh, and I kind of like that. So I'm going to sample some of that color, the darker purple color that happened when I blended it and see what happens if I just totally fill that with a different color now. I've done that also with a two-finger swipe to the right to lock the pixels on this layer. Um, a lower saturation purple in from the top to kind of create like a bit of an underglow. Maybe it's like sort of brighter and glowier on the inside of his ear. Experimenting with brushing in a little bit of a warmer kind of pink. I'm starting to like that. And there I'm creating a color contrast. The pink is more saturated and brighter, and the purple on the outside is less saturated and cooler. And I think even to heighten that, I'm going to see what happens when I brush in. Actually, in this case, I'm erasing, and I think that's probably not the best way. But I just want to see, when I erase and let some of that blue-gray in, what does that look like? I like that. But instead of erasing, I'm going to go in with a brush and do that so it's not destructive. <laughs> If I'm erasing the color away, then I can never get it back, and I'll never get that shape that I just spent a lot of time creating back. So I'm going to paint within that shape, the blue-gray, instead of erasing it out of that shape. Yeah. And just a nice fade, just to get that, that tip of the ear just a little bit darker to create a glow. Another thing this is subtly doing by having that pink closer down to the bottom is drawing the focus down to the middle of his face, uh, which is what I want. I want you to be looking him in the eyes and not super distracted by the sort of tops of his ears. And go with kind of like a, a brassy kind of darker brownish orange ochre. I think this is an ochre uh, for the earrings here. I'm just using those sketch lines as a pretty loose framework for the for the shape I'm going to do here. Not every, you know, part of the sketch is fully fleshed out, so a lot of decisions I can make now uh just with paint. So I'm deciding to give this a more chiseled look of the earrings, kind of a rougher kind of chiseled look as I go. It's pretty subtle, but Enjoy it. I'm keeping these also on a separate layer so that if I need to adjust them, uh, I'm not now erasing the pink that's underneath them or affecting the green-blue skin. I have them separately so I can deal with them separately if I, if I need to. If suddenly I step back and I look at the whole piece and I realize that you know they're clashing horribly with the color palette, I could just take that layer and adjust the hue and saturation of it to correct for that. All right. So again, this is still sort of, you know, 
it's a little less boring than that first phase of, of keeping everything super tidy. Now I have the added problem of, of thinking about how these colors are sort of clashing or balancing together. But it's still, you know, all sort of methodical and planning. This is still podcast town. So I think I'm going to, you know, like I'm sampling some of that pink from the ear and using it for the nose. Right now I'm just blocking in the shape and we'll see if I see if that that suits. It's not necessary immediately to commit to the the color as soon as you paint it down, especially if you're doing it in multiple layers the way that I am and using that selection as the outline to keep them all within the the shape. Uh But, you know, I can change that color of the nose after the fact if I find that it is the wrong kind of pink for, for what I'm going for. But if I were painting it all into one layer, which I have done sometimes, and that's, some, that's a, a technique. Sometimes you just prefer that look, everything kind of blending and smearing into each other. Or, you know, you just want the challenge of, of keeping everything tidy and all your sort of shapes separate from each other. But that does come later in the process. Usually at the very end, I'll paint over the top of everything and sort of uh, be less methodical about it. But I find that setting up a strong understructure uh, keeps things tidy and controllable. Uh, and you can always get crazier, but you can't always work back to a tidy system. And that happens uh, to be a really useful thing for concept art, too. Uh, if middle of the process, you show it to your boss, and your boss suddenly is like, no, he's supposed to be red! Like, you can make that change pretty easily if you keep things layered uh, in sort of a, a method like this one. Um, but if they're all sort of clumped together, you have to do some some pretty intense reconstructive surgery. Oops, a little big there. Let's scale that down. There we go to do some pretty intense reconstructive surgery uh if if everything has been collapsed into one layer and you're you're painting as though as though you're painting on a canvas it's one of the things that digital art does well so it's uh definitely useful to take advantage of that having those layers as a safeguard you know and sometimes you know concept art as a part of the process will call for those variations like that you show that work uh so you put it part of a sheet where you show this character in eight different color schemes uh, to see which one suits the, the client best. Again, much easier if you keep them in layers. And I've learned that the hard way because I was very stubborn and wanted to have everything in one layer and, and very simple. And have slowly, slowly over time adapted to, okay, fine. So yeah, this is, you can see me zooming out and back and forth here. That's just sort of the digital equivalent of me stepping back from the canvas. Uh, so now I'm just demonstrating, maybe I don't like how bright that is or how maybe I want it a little more orange, a little browner. So I can adjust that independent of the other colors now because it's on its own layer. So I'm going to lock those pixels again. Two fingers swipe to the right. Uh, having adjusted those colors a little bit, I'm going to go in with a soft brush and paint in some of that browner color I liked. Sort of warm it up at the base. Kind of the same thing I was doing with the ears a little bit, but with a slightly different color palette, just to give the, the nose a, a separate vibe from the inside of the ears so they're not exactly the same, but so that they're related and kind of harmonious. I think I'm liking that. Maybe, maybe you know, bringing it closer in, bringing some of that pink in there. Brushing up some of that green so it fades. Trying a paler. No, that's too, too intense. At this point, it's not just about which colors are harmonious as much as it is also about uh, whether they're pulling focus away. You know, whether they're really like distracting. Uh, and so that's a, that's something to balance throughout the, the process. I'm creating a new layer and then using that selection as a mask. Again, using the base selection as a mask. Uh, got the earrings on the top. Got the nose somewhere in the middle and the, the ears underneath the earrings. So all these layers are stacking 
strategically as well. So now I know I want to use this new layer I've made um, to create a new color for the uh, the sockets of his eyeballs. It's good that those are all layered uh, well so that I can paint underneath the nose, oops, or on the nose, there we go, underneath the nose without affecting the nose itself. So if I'm strategic about this, I can, you know, uh, paint in layers in a way that makes uh, the most sense to me. So that pale yellow is not what I'm looking for. But if I reduce the opacity on that, yeah, this is there, I kind of like that, somewhere in that zone. I find that you know, in certain creatures, uh, their eye sockets and areas where the the tissue reacts differently, blood will flow around it and stuff like that. Like our, our eyes and lips, sometimes you might have dark circles under your eyes. Um, some people like our, uh, <laughs> our orange uh, commander in chief has a kind of uh, lighter pockets around their eyes. It's just people that come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, but it's fun to observe those things and use them to uh, give your characters more interest and dimension. Don't always rely on the formula you have in your head. So I forgot his little teeth, so I'm going in there on a new layer, once again, with the, the mask of the, the silhouette selection. And that mask is keeping me inside the lines, but just blocking in these little teeth. Trying to anticipate the lighting that's going to eventually come in there. Just keep those crisp. Now, they're not going to be this bright in the finish, you know? They're going to be lit in all kinds of ways. And again, this is me. After a, a bit of practice, I can anticipate how I'm going to change uh, the color. I don't want his, like, little front teeth to be super super obvious in the final version i want them to be kind of just a little textural detail inside of his mouth while his like fangs that are kind of poking out here are a little brighter as well but since they're all the same local color the same like absolute objective color uh <coughs> at least ish i'm painting them all as one sort of enamel and i'll adjust that later And then keeping all the teeth on the same layer, separate from the skin, separate from the ears and stuff like that, allows me to lock the pixels on the teeth and uh, change their color if I want to. Add some discoloration or some texture to them down the line when I decide about that. <laughs> Sorry for all my <laughs> snuffling. I'm just thinking about the little teeth that I'm tucked in there and trying to interpret my my sketch to myself sometimes it's tough you you even as recently as 20 minutes ago you can't remember what you intended by a certain line or something so uh always important to try and keep track There we go. Sorry. Little details. Hard to wrangle. All right. So, and now that the teeth are in there, I'm going to sort of create yet another layer, masked similarly, to create the interior of the mouth. I mean, you sample from the pink of the ears. So again, using the color picker, I can, I can start at least with the colors I've already used and use those as a basis to create, you know, a darker purple that relates to the ear, you know, because I, I picked it from there and then adjusted it instead of just starting fresh entirely every time I pick a new color. Uh, that could backfire. So sometimes, you know, you want really distinctive colors that are wildly different from each other. But in this instance, I want some of these, the pinks and purples to har harmonize and the blues and greens to harmonize together. So just trying to keep that tidy there we go a little detail work 
realizing that some of these teeth are a little out of line from the mouth that I was envisioning. Some of these teeth I've tucked into the chin instead of the mouth. So I'm going to tuck that into the mouth. There we go. That's better. In some instances, I think I have readjusted the mouth shape to be out of whack. <laughs> this is the subtle, boring work of doing your job. Just making those little adjustments to the mouth, make sure everything's in place. Again, it's it's not super fun to watch, but it does lay the groundwork for the finish. There we go. Fill that mouth out a little bit. Make sure the teeth all fit into it right. And of course, it's a little easier when I'm not thinking to, to comment on it while I'm drawing. So this does go a little bit faster when I'm on my own, but... Uh, a separate layer again to sort of paint in the, the, oops, I think I might be on a layer, I don't know why that color is so different, oh, okay, I am underneath the layer of the uh, eye socket skin tone that I painted in, so I'm going to put that under and then paint over it, there we go, so I can get, yeah, the darker shape that I want that I can control. That'll happen pretty often. I'll, I'll I'll forget where I am in the layer stack and be super confused. Sometimes my pencil line will get out of control here. Uh, it's usually due to the fact that my Apple Pencil cap has become unscrewed a very little bit. Nine times out of ten, when my line art and the brush starts to malfunction, it's not like a program error. It's just that my cap has started to come unscrewed. Little detail, just adjusting the little, especially around the eyes. You know, when you're when you get into the the center of the design, into areas where there's going to be a lot of focus, people are going to be looking really closely. You want to make sure that the the shapes and lines are in a place that that you actually enjoy. And a lot of this stuff, you know, I admit as I go that I'm probably doing a lot of this to the extent that I'm doing it because. I'm the one who would notice, you know, not necessarily that anybody looking would note, you know, the subtle little wonkinesses of certain shapes or lines. But I think the cumulative effect is a good one. And uh, I think, you know, anybody who does this for long enough, you become a bit of a snob about your own work and technique. And you want to make sure that you don't look at the drawing later and think, oh, my gosh, that, you know, that line is so wobbly or that, you know, that shape was, you know, was so weak, you know, it didn't, you know, didn't work. And so each time you want to try and improve it. And sometimes that can, you can get into the weeds a little bit, trying to make everything so tidy and, and crisp and, and just so. And that can ruin the, the drawing too, you know, it's, that, that could be frustrating when you're thinking too much about it. You can really ruin the, the finish. All right. Those local colors are looking all right. I'm not positive yet that I'm sold on his underbelly it's not harmonizing quite the way I want. So I'm trying to play with maybe his eye socket colors, maybe a little bluer, a little greener. A little purple, maybe? Yeah, it's just kind of that froggy green I kind of like. At least as a starting point to get that pale color going. And then maybe the skin tone. I'm not going to, you know, I, I swing it wide here, not because I'm considering making any change that drastic, but because it sort of loosens my eye up and I can sort of see it fresh. And maybe I like that a little more saturated, a little lighter. Greener like that. I kind of like green. Maybe some compromise between the two. Yeah, again, when people ask about color and, and I wish I could give them a simple answer, but I think the, you know, little things like just noticing that you prefer green against pink instead of blue against pink is a personal decision you come to after looking at enough like adorable drawings of watermelon that you know uh, these weird little idiosyncrasies develop 
and preferences. Uh, and sometimes that's grounded in something and sometimes it's just down to your taste. But it's definitely always, it comes from experimentation. I watched a, a podcast or a lecture recently and one of the things the uh, the fellow mentioned was just uh, that the way that babies learn language is by going through every possible sound again and again until they get it right. Uh, and they just like sort of cycle through every pronounceable human sound. And I think that learning color and learning some of these, uh, what harmonizes, what works uh, together is the learning process is like that. It's like you, you, you feel free to just make those mistakes and, and make every possible combination of colors until you find one that really you like and it works for you. And maybe, you know, as I'm brushing this blue in here, I find that I actually kind of like the way that's dimmed down. Oh, you know, maybe I've moved away from the green direction that I was going and, and now I'm veering back towards blue. I'm doing some sort of visual equivalent of making every sound I can think to make until I find the one that sounds like the right word. That's a bit of a, a stretch metaphor wise, but this pale kind of ghostly green that's coming up from underneath them. I like that. That feels right to me. So there's still the green that harmonizes with the pink in that way that I enjoy. Uh, and that pale kind of greeny undertone kind of gets me both that like watermelon harmonization, but with kind of a pale corpsey look, which is good for like a nocturnal cave dwelling goblin bat. And that makes me want to go much darker with the uh, the skin tone above. So I'm playing with a little bit of that. And this is just all locked into that, that bottom-most layer of his skin tone. And I've been tooling with that just to see, now that I've changed that, do I want to adjust the ears a little bit, make them a little more... Yeah, make everything a little more orange as I go. A little less pink. Nope. I think I, nope. something in between again. I think I like the pink, but I want a little of that orange glow. So I'm going to sample that that I found and brush it into the pink. As I'm trying it out, I realize, oh, when I do a hue shift, I like that orange, but I, I don't want everything that comes with it. So I'll color pick it, go back in the history, and then and then brush that into the previous version. I don't know, I don't know if that's making any sense to you guys uh but uh yeah sort of moving back and and forth experimenting with things and I think I like that. It's a good happy marriage between both worlds. So sometimes at this point I'll flatten these layers of local color together into one big layer but I think for the purposes of what I've just been talking about that would be uh not a good idea. So I'm going to keep them layered, but I'm going to put them in a group together like I just did so that I can deal with that all sort of neatly. So we have the group of local colors and we have the sketch layer over the top. That's sort of the structure of this thing. Um, so I'm going to create a layer in between the sketch layer and the local color layer. And that's where I'm going to do the work of creating the sense of light. I'm going to set this layer. Oh, you know what? Actually, before I do that, I'm going to use the overlay to create a bit of an overall unifying light vibe. Overlay is a, a layer mode. and uh, Using a soft brush, I can brush in like a, a pale uh, yellow or uh, let me confine that again. I'm going to mask this new layer so everything stays inside the lines. But now I can brush in this like golden color to brighten things up because what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to add shadows to it. So even though he's quite dark, um, as it is with the base colors, I, I want something I can add shadows to. So I want to brighten up this whole base set of colors. If that makes, uh, again, if that makes sense if you're tracking with that, I want to bring the, all the colors I just did up towards light. And I'm experimenting with brushing a little bit of cool light into there. I think ultimately I want that kind of colder light instead of the warmer light uh, as, a, as a vibe for this. Overlay I use a lot, and, and I use a soft brush in an overlay layer for glowing effects and sort of sort of broad 
ambient light effects. It's not like super high contrast light. It's it's sort of the big fuzzy movements of color and light across the surface. And I'm using a bunch of different colors. And again, I'm experimenting with what what works well. You might lose your way for a bit and create something that you don't like as much, but you can always erase it or adjust it or change it later. Let's get a little Bob Ross, just just happy little accidents, you know, just there's no wrong answer. So there you go. I've brightened it up a little bit. It gives me a little bit more to work with in terms of adding shadow. So I, if you start from black, you can't really add shadow to black, right? So on top of that, create a new layer, again with the same mask. Set this layer mode is going to be multiply. Multiply, uh, just like when we set the sketch layer to multiply, it, it makes the layer sort of translucent so that you, whatever you do on that layer affects all the colors and the layers underneath it. So when I take a pale blue, like this here, and I stroke it across all the colors, all the colors are still there underneath the blue, but they're all affected by the shadow of the blue. So it creates kind of a, a, a unified... Uh, sense of shadow across the pinks, across the greens, across the blues. They're all uh, underneath the the shadow of of this new blue multiply layer. The, at this point, I don't necessarily want to, again, settle on this blue color of the shadows in the end, but it's useful just to find any sort of neutral shadow color that works for you uh, at this point and begin to paint in and think about just the shape, the volume, and the light. And this is the fun part. So this is what all the setup has been for and trying to keep things tidy. Now that I can keep this, this new layer confined to the mask of that silhouette, and uh, all the local colors are kind of living in their spot, I can get in there and start to, to knock in the shadows. <coughs> and that's a really fun part for me. I, I really love this part. What you're seeing me do here is playing with the softness of the edges. And that's been a newer thing for me uh, to control. I, I, it took me so long to understand or even see uh, what a soft edge was versus a hard edge or why I would do that. So the chin is rounding down, right? It's sort of curving around. The light is coming from this angle and it's bouncing off the chin, which is rounding down, which goes into this fold. It rounds the next one and the next fold after that and sort of gets darkest in those creases between the folds. So those folds are going to be where the light pinches and gathers the most. And those are going to be a hard edge. As it rounds the fold, that's going to be a soft edge. If you can see what I'm saying and doing, I, I if if it were me like several years ago, I feel like I could have told me to my face and I still wouldn't have been able to understand. I was just so dense. Uh, I just couldn't quite comprehend. I was too concerned about just the shadows in general and, and, and painting, you know, in its most basic ways, you know, and I was still learning. So you might not track with this and that's fine, but uh, I'm finding that I love... Uh, what I can accomplish out of controlling the softness and hardness of the edges of my shadows. It tells me a lot about the volume of a shape. So I'll do a single brush stroke. And then again, so right now I'm using Tara's oval sketch. I'm using it uh, in a large -ish size. Oh, it's actually quite a small size, but I'm using it on the, the tilt on the side. So I'm tilting the stylus and using it to sort of chunkily erase and paint into the shadow layer soft and it's got that gritty tooth and I really like the texture in this instance uh, this is one of my favorite ways that Tara's sketch and Max's shader pastel both shine through <laughs> is uh, in that sort of loose soft kind of uh, chunky chalky texture uh, I find that that's a really nice look and that was new for me in Procreate. I, I had been used to doing really glossy kind of smooth work in Photoshop, uh, but also loving when I was using watercolor, uh, doing really like toothy textured work. And so Procreate, uh, I found that I was able to marry the two. And uh, yeah, those soft edges. You can see around the chin as I'm doing this too. Uh, one of the things I've fallen in love with is like losing an edge. So 
where the soft edge disappears and sort of touches the silhouette and then comes back underneath the chin. Uh, so these, these little things like that become uh, sort of artistic obsessions after a while. I think it's like a, a super like you do this long enough and you start to develop like snobby aficionado -y kind of preferences and, and losing edges like that is like, that's my jam now. Like letting the shadow disappear and pick back up on the other side of the shape and leave it to your imagination to imagine like the, the passage of light and, and shape between those two things right there. So see, I could contour it and create a line all the way around it. But if you let it lose itself and sort of tuck away behind that and pick back up, you tell people visually a lot more about the dimension. And again, I just, it's, it happens to be a preference of mine. I like the look of that. It gives you a, a little more, it's left to the imagination that way. So here's where I'm going to use uh, Max's shader pastel on the same layer as a, uh, kind of a softer, big a gradient brush to, to add a textured gradient to some of the stuff that I've just been doing, especially down to this fat pad at the base of the neck. Got it really nice. It's a gradient, but it still has that soft tooth that Max's brush has. And that's where I find it really shines. And it marries really well with the texture of Tara's oval sketch to create, um, yeah, just a really nice sort of set of different soft gradients with a, a toothy texture that blend really nicely and procreate. Uh, I'm not a big user of the smudge tool, but I will rarely use it, uh, like in this instance, and I'll set it to Max's shader pastel uh, as the smudge tool and use that to sort of blend things together. And again, that's a blend with a little bit of that tooth to it. So it's consistent across the whole thing. If I were to blend with a smooth brush, it would start to feel like a different uh, look would start to come out of it. And I, I'm not sure that I, I want it to have both a smooth and a textured look. I want to stick to one consistent kind of vibe. Uh, so again, I'm using just this one blue color, but the way I've set this up gives me a lot of opportunity for control of those shadow colors down the line. And I'll show you that later. Right now I'm just using this pale kind of greeny blue to paint in all the shadows. But since it's on its own layer, uh, and that layer is affecting all these other colors, I can now use that layer and lock those pixels on that layer um, so that... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Keep on uh, having hiccups. Uh, so I can use that layer to, to create nuance in the shadow to add colors to the shadow areas. Uh, and that will come later for me. But right now I'm just concerned with the sculpting of those forms with shadow and light. What's freeing about this method is going back and forth and being able to erase in and out of it gives me the opportunity to feel like I'm sculpting. And I can focus just on the light, just on the forms. I don't have to think in this mode about, you know, each individual local color and how the shadow's affecting those right now. I can just think almost like an inker. Uh, if you guys like Mike Mignola, I love how he'll ink and just let whole chunks of his drawing fall into shadow. And he'll sculpt the, the dimensions of the drawing with these really confident, uh, big, thick blacks. And these aren't black, but it's a similar way of, of sort of sculpting by just focusing on the effect of the light across the form. Some people choose to, in their method, do this part in black and white first and then lay their colors over it. It just depends on how you like to work. I think I, I prefer to see the colors first and then uh, then work the, the, the dimensional shadow over that. So I'm doing the little detailed wrinkles all around his eyes. Ultimately, I want those eye sockets to have that kind of spherical orb dimension to them. But I'm thinking ahead strategically uh, that I'm going to I'll show you in a, in a little bit, I think, uh, how I add a little bit of texture, not texture, but uh, dimension to those eye sockets. But right now, all I'm, I'm concerned with is sort of the, the finer shadow detail and not the overall uh, dimension of those shapes on this particular layer. So I'm just thinking about the little wrinkles, sort of establishing the drawing, kind of looking at the, the faint sketch lines from that first layer 
that I still have faintly uh, on top of all of this and uh, trying to show the, the work of all the lines and the, the bits of the, the drawing and the sort of subtle turns of form that I had planned for it and doing that, uh, but with light. Line in this instance could be very efficient. You know, there, I could use um, outline to show you all of these details. And uh, sometimes I will, and I love u using line and working in that style. But I also find it's, it's very fun to solve those problems of line, but with shadow to, to try and uh, communicate the shapes that I would have communicated with line. And line's kind of a shortcut. It, it doesn't exist in nature, right? So we add that to add a diagrammatical clarity to things. Uh, it, it, you know, you draw a line around a wrinkle, around a shape, around, you know, any sort of, you know, fold in his nose or whatever, and you know exactly where the edge is. Uh, and that's a lot harder when you're sort of painting without line. You have to do a little more work, but the I, I think the look can be very rewarding. Uh, lines can be very useful for co for concept art for that reason. They can be very quick and efficient in sort of showing people where the edges are, but... Uh, when you're trying to communicate the sense of volume, lines can sort of fight you. And volume is often very important uh, when you're developing characters for, you know, 3D sculpture eventually. So now I'm just working into those wrinkles up there. I start, as you can see, really loose brush strokes that are pretty uh, nonspecific. And then I'm erasing to make those more... Uh, sharp and dynamic, carving a sharp edge on one side and, and a soft edge on the other side of each fold of his, like, wrinkly forehead. Yeah, so thinking about that, the soft and, and hard edge, uh, again, it's not, you know, it's not always super important for the the client that you know, all the edges be elegantly sort of fussed with that way. But I think most clients appreciate it with whatever time you have that you're able to to give them something as beautiful as as you can um, and as tended to as you can. And not everybody can articulate that that's what they like or what they want. But, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure, first and foremost, you're hitting all the things that will be functionally important uh, if it is for, you know, for a use as a concept artist or a viz dev artist. Um, but then, you know, people are, are trusting you to, uh, yeah, to, to show them something they didn't expect to show them something that only you can give them. Um, And you want to communicate with a with an audience. You know, you want them to be able to see what's going on, to understand what it is you're trying to communicate in terms of the design. Um, ultimately, you know, uh, I'm a lot more interested in color, in the design itself, in the story, in the world building. Uh, I'm not that focused on technique. And so usually when I think through technique and I think through the way I paint, I, I think functionally first in some senses. I get snagged on on elements of beauty that I really love and I think that's part of the job but I definitely try and uh, keep in my mind always what the function of a of a given drawing is especially because the real joy of what I do comes in for me with uh yeah again like just creating these concepts that tell a story and create a world and evoke a mood and a tone uh and I, I don't want anything that I'm doing to overshadow that. I don't want somebody to just come away thinking, well, that's really pretty. Uh, and that's it. You know, I'd love for them to think about the implications and the ideas and the shapes. And maybe that's pretty and it's new and it's weird. And I didn't think I would like that, but I do. Um, or that challenged me or inspired me or, you know, that was colors or shapes or an idea that I, I didn't anticipate. And I also just like painting, you know, this is just, there's just a, a joy in just laying down color and shape. Um, so there's always a balance between just the playfulness of painting and the function and the 
the joy of creating uh, complex systems and stuff like that and, and doing things for a purpose. And then also just the joy of creating something pretty, something fun to look at. So once again, I'm using Max's Shader Pastel to lay in bigger sort of chunks of soft shadow. Um, you know, I'm using Tara's Oval Sketch to, to get in there and do these little details and sort of the fine finesse stuff. But then uh, back and forth with Max's Shader Pastel to create those bigger swaths of, of color and dimension. It's that shadow grouping too, you know, uh, that kind of goes across the whole surface of a thing that doesn't uh, adhere to to every contour. You know, it's it's it kind of leaves that up to your imagination. That I just like it when I see it too. You know, I just I I enjoy doing it, but I also like looking at it. And so that's always like when you encounter things like that. Those are the things you want to learn about and try and adapt into your own style. <laughs> Because no style is an island. It's not like you came up with these things on your own or some ridiculous thing like that. You know, I'm always learning from people. But I learn a lot, especially from the people where, you know, I look at something and I'm like, oh, that's the look. I feel personally about how nice that looks. And so I'm always trying to to study new techniques. And uh, definitely this came from from looking at art that I enjoy. <laughs> And moving away from sort of the previous phase of that, which when I was like an adolescent was just all comics and all the, you know, sort of heavy outline, black ink kind of look. Uh, and I love that. And I still have a soft spot for that, but I've definitely moved uh, in a different direction since. So using, again, the big shader pastel to block in this and using an eraser to erase back out of it. Uh, same same brush, but now as an eraser. Yeah, I find that going back and forth is a is a really um, fun way to work positive and then work negative. Is a fun way to sculpt uh, light around a form, and then I'll go in to create those striations, the kind of texture of the the skin, the kind of weird little jags, and even these, like the way the striations go in, I, I wouldn't necessarily think it's obvious, but like. Uh, Sam Bosma and um, Guy Davis both have these really like wonderful kind of uh, idiosyncrasies the way they lay down these like little lines and sort of textured line art when they ink uh, and this is kind of my way of adapting some of what I like about that into my painting process and adding these little sort of uh, textural marks in in places where I I want them think that they'd be useful but yeah like I said no style is an island so I'm just I'm a, I'm a magpie kind of collecting little bits from styles that I like and learning what I can and it'll change I think that's another thing is that uh I think it's pretty funny when artists are super protective of their techniques or style I, I understand that I I get possessive too um but we're not you know we're as an artist you're so much more than just one technique one way of doing things and I think it's super um fun to be able to experiment and move on and learn and and, and share and then grow and then abandon the, a way of doing things and pick up a new one this is just the way I, I've been really enjoying currently doing things doesn't mean that I you know hate line art or have moved away from that style forever or anything like that it just means that I'm discovering a lot of things that are new that I'm really enjoying with this particular method it looks like I lost his lip there, so I'm just going to go in there and, and find the underside of his lip. And again, the tricky bit is letting the shadow pool in those sort of padded areas where his jowl is more pronounced. And then like uh, playing with losing the, the line right in the middle of the lip to create that dimension. Get that hard edge underneath this here. Erase it from overlapping the tooth as it folds there. And then see I'm kind of losing that lip line in the middle a little bit. <laughs> just this hateful little pug goblin right here. Just a, just a hateful little gremlin. Just a nasty little gibbery bat creature. 
uh, go back and forth. So I want the lip to be super clearly defined. It's kind of, it's, it's got something to it. Not everything's a science, you know? That's why they call it art. <laughs> it's not profound. Um, definitely just go back and forth on certain decisions. Give him a little wrinkles around his uh, his eyes. Try not to fight the form too much. Don't make those too distracting. Just subtle. I don't want to ruin the orb kind of vibe of the eye socket there. So yeah, again, like I mentioned earlier, I've got these little wrinkly lines all around the orbit of his eye. So here's another thing I'll do sometimes. I'll break away from that layer, create a new layer, again, mask the same way, set to multiply. Uh, and on top of this set of shadows, I'll paint another layer of shadows. Uh, in this instance, I want to use a big soft brush and create uh, like a shadow on the eye socket. Now, that's not what I want right there, what I just painted. I want to erase out of that with a big soft brush to create that sort of sense of an orb so I'm making that kind of big and I'm not gonna since it's on a new layer I'm not gonna lose any of that wrinkly detail by erasing and playing with this it's sort of in addition to and see now I have by erasing that out this like kind of look and feel of this rounded sort of orb of his eye socket Uh, and I quite like that. So I think I'm going to add a little bit of that sort of around the different areas and create a bit of a vignetting of sort of receding dimension all around him. Could get that roundness in there. That's fun. Yep. So it's not just the one layer. Sometimes it's multiple layers of sort of shadow affecting each other and... Yep, and now the sketch layer is entirely gone, and uh, so there's no lines at all anymore, and I think it's finally at the place where it's really standing on its own, and you can still see all the details I intended and, you know, sort of sense the dimension of it. Forgot to sort of give his teeth a little shape, so I'm going to go in there and get some some dimensional shadows and some drop shadows, some cast shadows on those. And uh, it'll be, you know, the teeth aren't, aren't like the most important bit. And so, and I don't, hopefully nobody's zooming in too close on this drawing uh, when they actually see it. But it's the little things that sort of sell the sense of light. And if you're pretty sure that it's not going to distract from the overall shape that you've created with like the lip and the mouth and stuff like that, then adding these little shadows can give you a little bit more nuance and detail. Yeah, just a little fussing. Yeah, all right. So all of the, the shadows now, now that I, I've gotten them to a place where I like it and where I feel like I've got the soft edges, the, the harder edges, the sort of soft gradients of things rounding each other and, and creating the, the different shapes. I I can still erase and, and, and add and, and fuss with it from this point on, but since it's in a good place and I've set it up so that the shadows are on their own layers, now I want to start to move towards getting into the the color that uh, I mentioned that I will paint into the shadows. And, you know, yeah, I think part of that process and that separating out the, the shadows from the local color as process helps me think different ways. You know, I can think easily in terms of, you know, which colors are going to go where, and then I can think separately about how to light them, and I don't have to think of it all at once. And art's complicated, you know? There's so many different parts of this process that anything you can do to separate those parts out uh, and keep those um, sort of systematically so you can have a consistent result, you know, because that's a big part of this too, uh, is having a, a result at the end that feels like a consistent look. Um, so now I'm going to flatten all of those uh, shadows into one layer, which is looking good to me now. Uh, and now having that separate, 
uh, I'm going to sort of play with some of the, the light that exists inside that layer. I like him. He's feeling good. My little back album friend. At this point, you know, I feel like we've done enough of the hard parts of the process. There's that sketch layer again, just to show you like where, where things have fallen. Oh, I forgot he has eyes. <laughs> Pupils. I think I wanted them to be maybe pink. Or like a pale yellow, I think. Let's try pink and see how that looks. I mean, it's not bad. It works. But it doesn't really stand out because I got pink all over it. Let me try this as a sort of yellow. Yeah, I feel like it's just a brighter. It pops more. It's more arresting. I'm going to go with kind of a pale, like a sickly yellow on his eyes. And once I'm at this point in the process, like, you know, he's feeling like like I, I wanted. And I've rounded the corner of wondering if it's going to turn out all right. And now I'm into the place where I'm doing finishing touches. However, the second eye is always such an issue for me. I don't want to make him look like he's cross-eyed or wall-eyed or, you know, I want him to feel like he's focusing on a single subject. <laughs> uh, one thing, it's always such a, such a challenge for me and I always seem to leave it to the wrong spot, but I should flip the canvas. Haha. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it's a nightmare and everything's a mess. This actually turned out all right when I flipped it, but I should usually flip it a lot sooner in the process than that. But flipping the canvas can give you a different perspective on the drawing you've been doing. And you can look at it and realize like, oh, okay, you know, the symmetry is off here or his uh, cheekbones are, you know, totally different shapes. When I flip it, I notice it, you know, it gives you a fresh perspective on the drawing. And so I'll do that sometimes when I'm trying to draw the second eyeball, whichever eyeball that has to be, uh, so that I can make sure that he's focusing, you know, on whatever it is he's supposed to be looking at instead of uh, sort of looking cross-eyed. All right. The glowy light that I had before, it's there, it's working. I think I'm going to adjust that a little bit. So I'm going to make that a little darker and more saturated. I think that's a little more interesting now. Maybe... I don't know. All right. So this light blue shadow layer, all isolated, set to multiply. I'm going to lock those pixels. Again, a two finger slide to the right to lock pixels on the layer. Big soft brush. And at this point, I can go in and paint inside those shadows once I've locked the pixels. It's something even as crazy as like a like a dark red and see how that affects the overall look. So using a dark red on that, that's sort of the effect and the contrast can go wild there if that's what I want. Um, and since I have in mind that he's sort of under a cooler light, I'm going to try and experiment with what it looks like if warmer shadows on this uh, cooler looking sort of uh, palette of greens and blues. Uh, with this uh, this technique, it's easy to brush in sort of light into the shadows and create that sense of subsurface scattering, which is kind of when the light comes through, like when you put a flashlight behind your hand and you can see the red sort of dim glow through the shadows of your hand. Um, subsurface scattering is just a light that bounces around under the skin, is caught by the skin and kind of creates a, a weird glow, like when the sun's behind your ear. Uh, so you can do that by painting color into the shadow layers like this. I just I, At this point, I just kind of go nuts and, and kind of, once again, just lay colors in, react, and see if I like that, adjust it accordingly, uh, try to create sort of warm glows in areas that are closer to the light, uh, darker pools, maybe cooler colors here, uh, warmer colors there. It's really, you know, again, it's guess and check. Uh, I post a little video to Twitter about some of the, you know, if you have a cool light source, your shadows will be warm. If you have a warm light source, your shadows will be cool. Uh, I think I talked about that in the color video as well. But those are just general guidelines. If you find something that really, you know, uh, has a good look and feels right for the drawing and the vibe you were going for, then those rules can be bent. But I think it's important to, to know what the rules are that you're playing with. So those are the colors now not set to multiply. And when I set them to multiply, they mix with the underpainting 
And they look like this. I think it looks pretty good. I'll fade that in and out. Yeah, I, I can I can reduce the opacity of those shadows and create like a dimmer sort of washed out look. But now I have that and I can still adjust all the local colors. I could turn them red now if I wanted to. But uh, at this point, I'm going to, on top of all of that, now that I have the shadows and the underpainting, I'm going to go with an overlay layer and create some glows on the very top. Uh, create a little bit of, of glowy light as though it were coming through the, uh, the thin skin of his eyelid for his eyeballs. Just using a pale yellow on a layer set to overlay with a soft brush. So again, really, this entire process is, is down to those three brushes. Like Tara's oval sketch... The soft brush and Max's shader pastel are really the only brushes I've been using the entire time. Um, and the soft brush here is really useful for these kind of effects glows. I'm trying to see what maybe a little warm light on the nose would look like. Which I do kind of like. I like some of that. It's not the shape that I want yet, but it's definitely creating an effect that I enjoy. Kind of brightening up that space and adding some interest to that pink. Yeah, and it really is just about play at this point. I'm just trying something out, backing off of it, trying something again. I think it's a mistake to think you need to be immediately good at color. <laughs> I really was not. And like I said earlier, you only get to it by trying every possible wrong answer first. Um, oh, maybe some, some pink into those eye sockets just to give that a little more color variance and interest. And so I'm changing, I'm going back into the skin tone now and painting some purple into those eye sockets because, you know, since it's layered, I can do that. I can look at the f finished result and, and say, oh, you know, I think I want to change some of the <coughs> the fundamental colors of this piece. And I can still do that, which is just, you know, like I said, it's such a huge help with digital painting. Uh, and on that skin layer, I can go in and even add a little subtle variance where his, his lips get paler sort of the edge of his cheekbone and stuff like that, get a little bit paler as they, they eke towards that. You can use a blurring tool to kind of smooth that transition. That's the smudge tool there. It's just a little subtle stuff. Again, it's you know, mostly to please me, but also just to wake it up and, and, you know, so much of the process is just uh, reacting to what you've put down, you know? Acting and reacting and acting and reacting. Brushing and erasing, laying down a color, laying it down another color to respond to that first one. Trying out different levels of contrast, sort of seeing what you like and, and, and keeping moving. But I think the, the constant there is, is keeping moving. Uh, as long as you continue to paint and continue to try and continue to experiment and continue to push on your comfort zone, you'll find things that you really like color combinations, techniques, ways of painting, brushes that you, you didn't want to try that uh, turn out to be just a, you know, big time life changers for you, big, big indispensable tools down the line. Yeah. So ultimately, uh, there you go. That's the, that's the process from start to finish, more or less. Uh, Tara's oval sketch sort of s sustains me through the sketching process all the way up to the, the shading and lighting. Max's shader pastel, again, a great brush for adding those soft shadows with a little bit of grit to them. Also for blocking in and sort of big brush stroke movements. And for everywhere you don't want a brush stroke and you're, you're interested in sort of those, the gradient passage between colors, the soft brush is a great way to replace the gradient tool in uh, Procreate. Thanks for watching, you guys.